Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Did you come to have church tonight? Did you come to encounter his presence? Hallelujah. Be changed by his word. That's what I came for. I came to praise the Lord and lift him up and, and pray that we usher and host his presence in this place tonight. Hallelujah. We want to start out our prayer request with praise reports. Brother Alvin um, Ambrosi had back surgery today, this morning, and everything went well. So we want to continue to lift him up in our prayers for a speedy recovery. And also, I thank God for Ezra and Ezekiel. They are doing 100% better today. No fevers, no not not even congestion or anything. So praise God for that. Yes, hallelujah. Um, but we want to continue to lift up little Adeline and Sister Christy Bass. Um, they are still sick, so we, God can do it for them. He's going to do it for um, Christy and Adeline as well. So we're going to pray for them tonight. And also, Sister Christy says, remember her brother-in-law, Roger Murphy. He goes tomorrow for the biopsy of the tumor that they found. And so let's just pray for a good report. He is a Christian. He's got every covenant of the blood. Hallelujah. And so we can trust and believe that his word is going to show us a good report tomorrow tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, are there any requests that you perhaps didn't get a chance to write down that you would like to speak at this time? Anybody behind me? Praise God. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sister Becky said, remember Tiana tonight. So let's remember her in our prayers. Anybody uplifted hand tonight? Praise God. Praise God. Go to God in praise and in worship and in adoration as we give these needs into his hands, trusting and knowing that he's already knows the need and he's ready and able and willing to meet that need. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Stand with me tonight as we take these needs to God in prayer. As always, we have people in our church. We have a lot of sickness going around right now and I know there's a lot of sickness just in the general population right now, but um, we have people that need absolute miracles in their life, and I believe that we serve a miracle work in God. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight in faith believing. Let's unite our faiths together because the scripture says that where two agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done, and I'm believing that tonight. Holy God, we come before you tonight. Father, we cherish the very opportunity to be in your house. God, we just thank you, God, for the privilege to come together with our brothers and sisters. Dear God, let us be united to, together tonight, Father, in one mind, one accord. Dear God, to come together to hear your word. God, Father, to uh, seek our, uh, to, to look deep and to, to realize where we are. God, that we might be revived. Father, we just pray that you would revive your people, that they might rejoice. Oh, God, and I pray, Father, for each and every request that's been given in tonight. God, those that were spoken, every name that was called. God, every hand that was raised, Father. God, you know the urgency of each need, Father. You know, God, those that are uh, sick and afflicted. You know the troubles and the trials and the situations that people are going through. Dear God, you know those that are closest to hell tonight. Dear God, and I pray that your conviction power of God would reach down and find that person. Dear God, that is so close, so close to leaving this world in a condition that's uh, not uh, conducive, oh God, to meeting you. Oh God, we just pray that you would find that sinner. God, seek them out, oh God. Father, we know that you left the 99 to find that one. And dear God, we're just praying, Father, God, for backsliders. We're praying for those that have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And God, we just pray that uh, you would find them, Father, that your holy conviction uh, power would just uh, touch their hearts and uh, God, manipulate their heart and their mind, Father. God, that they will see you uh, as they've never seen you before. And dear God, I just pray in this service tonight God, that you will show us your glory. God, we want to see you, Father. God, we just welcome you into our hearts. God, we open up our hearts and our lives to you tonight. And dear God, we want your will to be accomplished. God, we want to reach our divine destiny in you tonight, Father. God, we want your purpose to be fulfilled in our lives. Oh God, we thank you for the praise report. We thank you for what you're doing. And God, we just pray that your hand would rest upon us this night. Dear God, and our holy anointing would just fall in this place tonight. Father, we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we ask it. Amen and amen. Please remain standing and worship with us as we sing. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. I want to sing that second verse one more time. You know, there's a lot of people, they want to take the blood out of this thing. But I'm telling you what, it's the blood of Jesus that picked us up and washed us clean. Hallelujah. It's the blood of Jesus that wipes away all the sin, all the doubts, all the fear. Hallelujah. It's the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. That has not lost his power. The church may have lost his power. The world has lost everything. But the blood of Jesus has never, never, and it never will lose his power. Hallelujah. Sing it. It's
precious, that precious love. And from sin, thank God I am now free. I am redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed. Amen. Somebody give the Lord a thunderous hand clap of praise. Amen. I'm so glad tonight that I am redeemed. Amen. Not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb. Somebody say amen. If you're saved and you're glad you're saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm come up here. I'm going to lift the offering up here in just a moment. Uh, the way we've been doing in this uh, post-COVID. I don't know if it's post-COVID or not. Uh, climate. We've got the buckets out front. There's one at the one or two at the back that you can participate in. But we want to bless the man of God and his family. And we're we're in a treat tonight because, or in for a treat because Brother Michael's got a, a right many of his family members, and I believe they're going to come and bless us with song and in just a few moments. And we're glad to have them. I'll let him introduce the rest of his family, but I also want to recognize that his mom and daddy are here. And his daddy is Reverend Arnold Ball, Sister Judy Ball. So good to have y'all tonight. Amen. Now, I went to Bible college with Brother Arnold, and he didn't say a whole lot, but he was like E.F. Hutton. I don't know, some of y'all don't remember E.F. Hutton, but there's an old commercial that said when E.F. Hutton said something, everybody stopped and listened. That's the way we all were. We all run our mouth, but whenever Brother Ball spoke, everybody hushed because we wanted to hear what he had to say. He actually preached a homecoming for us, I believe it was last year. So good to have Brother Arnold. It's also good to have a number of the people from my home church in Williamston, the Life Builders Church of God, and their pastor, Jonathan Knox. Brother Jonathan, if you would lift your hands so everybody know who, amen, good to have him. And uh, I can't leave her out, but he brought my mama with him, amen. Good to have mama tonight, amen. Mama just turned 82. She looks like she's 65, and she's blessed, amen, amen. I'm blessed to have her, a godly example that has been a, a tremendous influence in my life all these years. And I'm scanning around here, and I just saw Brother Johnny Barber, Pastor Johnny Barber, and his wife, amen, from Shadow of the Cross. If you'll lift your hand, amen. Praise the Lord. We used to have church uh, at the Methodist Church down there in Jamesville, and he, he got fired up, and the Lord has used him mightily. Good to have you, Brother Johnny. We appreciate you being here today. Amen. Would you stand at this time? Hope I hadn't left anybody out. Amen. Praise the Lord. We just thank you for being here tonight, all the home folks, the visitors, and we've come to have church. Amen. This man has been delivering his soul to us. He's heard from the Lord, and I believe that he's more than an evangelist. I believe he operates also in the, in the prophetic and also as a revivalist. Amen. How many of you know we need that? We need a prophetic word. 
We need someone to speak to us about what revival really means and what God wants to do in these last days. Amen. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians that the evangelist is a gift to the church. And this is our opportunity right now after we pray that we're going to uh, uh, take this opportunity to give to the work of the Lord and bless this man at this time. Brother Jonathan, I'm going to ask you, come on up here. Everybody see how what a good-looking young man you are. Come on up here, brother. Amen. We're going to put you on the spot. This young man's fired up for the Lord. Amen. And I've, I've just been blessed to be able to uh, be a part of his life and him be a part of my life. Brother Jonathan, if you would take an opportunity, greet the people and pray over this offering. Amen. God bless you, brother. Amen. <laughs> Oh, man, you guys have a great pastor. I tell you, I love Brother Gary. Uh, I look at him as more than a pastor, but also as a mentor in my life, and I'm just grateful to have him and his mother and their support. And so I just am grateful for the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer over the tithe and offering. Blessed are you, Lord our God, O King of this universe, Father, for you are faithful, you're good, you're holy, you are just, you're righteous, you are love, Lord, and we praise you for that. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away every sin in the world, Lord, the greatest gift the world has ever seen come through the blood of Christ. And we thank you, Father. I ask that the offering that we give tonight, Lord, we would soak it in our prayers, soak it in our tears, Lord. Let it be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom, Father. Let souls be saved through it, Lord. Let it go forth and accomplish that which you would have it to do, Father. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Just come forward and drop your offering in the blue, blue buckets, please. Or the music plays. <laughs> How about it for your band tonight? Come on. Wow. What a wonderful job. What a wonderful job. It is so good to be in God's house. Why don't you look at the person beside you and tell them they're the best looking you've seen them all week long. For anybody that lied, we will have an order call afterward. <laughs> it is so good to be with you tonight, to have my family, as your pastor mentioned, to have my mother and father with me and all of, our, all of our guest ministers, wow, you know, it puts a preacher on the spot when you have preachers listening to you. Now, here's something that I've learned, though, and I'm not going to talk to the congregation. I'm just talking to the preachers. I was told years ago that it's hard to get a preacher to back you up. They like it when they're preaching and people back them up, but it's hard when you're preaching to get a preacher to back you up. So here's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to expect the preachers. Is that all right, members? I'm going to expect the preachers to help back me up tonight. Amen. It is so, so good to have all of our visitors tonight. I did not turn around to see which one of you is Sister Bateman. You are, you know, I want to apologize to you for being the mother of Gary and Mark Bateman. There are crowns that will be unable to be worn in heaven because of your dealings with these boys. And so, <laughs> anyway, I, I love your boys, both of them, and uh, I thank God for their ministries. You know, this year has been, or this past 18 months, has been a devastating time. And I've had a lot of people ask, why do we think we're going through this? And of course, we all have our various answers, and, you know, as ministers, we always try to come up with the best explanation and try to weave in a message of hope 
But at the same time, I've had people who have called me and said, I don't know that I can make it. I've had ministers call me, Pastor Bateman, and say, I'm ready to give up. I've had members tell me, I've lost loved one, I've lost jobs. When I go back and I look at this past 18 months, I think sometimes we do have to ask ourselves, how did we make it? How did we make it? You know, the answer is very simple. Him. I want you to know I, I could not have made it without Jesus Christ. I don't know how you're making it if you do not have Jesus Christ. But God sent His Son. And they called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. See, He bled and He died just to buy my pardon. Hallelujah. And an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Sing it with me if you know it. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone because I know he holds the future my life is worth the living just because he lives sing it with me tonight would you oh because he I can face tomorrow, yes I can, because he lives. All my fears are gone, because I know he holds the future. My life is worth the living just because. Sing it one more time. Oh, because he lives, I can face tomorrow and the next day and the next because he lives. Yes, my life is worth a living just because he lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want everybody to stand. I want everybody to stand. Brother, if you'll go on and drop that on the uh, screen for me. You know, one of the things that I miss is the old congregation singing. There was something about when everybody joined together, singing something that they knew, it just seemed to bring a unity in the church. And I remember hearing songs like, oh, I want to see him. Heaven's Jubilee, he abides and I just remember as a kid watching as the people of God just became excited because we were singing more than a melody. We were singing theology. 
Friend, I believe with all of my heart that we are still living in the age of the Spirit. I believe that we are still in the hour where God said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And I believe that he is abiding here tonight. Does anybody feel the abiding presence of the Holy Ghost? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sing it and mean it. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say you're full of the Holy Ghost and power? I want us to sing it like that tonight. He abides. Hit it at 110 miles an hour. Let's see where we go at it. Come on, help me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way. For the hand of God in all my life I see. And the reason of my bliss, yes, the secret all is this, that the comforter abides with me. He abides. full of sin once I had no peace within till I heard how Jesus died upon the tree oh then I fell down at his feet and there came a peace so sweet now the comforter abides with me oh he abides as a bird and just as free oh for the spirit has control jesus satisfies my soul now the comforter abides with me Thirsting for the things of the world, they take and we Long ago, I gave them up and instantly. All my nights were turned to day, all my burdens rolled away. Now the comforter abides with me. Oh, he abides, yes, he abides. Oh, hallelujah, he abides with me. And I'm rejoicing. Sing it, Church of God. Oh, he abides. Yes, he abides. Oh, hallelujah, he abides with me. I feel him right now. I'm rejoicing night and day. I am not walking there away. For the comforter abides with
you know it, why don't you worship him? If you know it, why don't you worship him? I said, if you know it, why don't you worship him? Hallelujah, hallelujah, come on. He'll inhabit the praises of his people. He'll inhabit the praises of his people. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now just lift up your hands and praise him because you want to. Just worship him because you want to. Just worship him because you want to. He's a mighty God. He deserves our praise. He deserves our honor. He deserves the glory. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. So, Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. No, there is no one else like you. Tell them from your heart. You deserve the glory and the honor. So, Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. So, Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. No, there is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. There is no remain standing for prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We praise you because you are in our midst. Father, we glorify you. We know, dear Lord, that you are going to do something extraordinary tonight. Not because I am here, but because you are here. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us tonight. Overshadow us with your glory. The joy of the Lord fill this house tonight. Let the power of the Spirit reign upon us. Father, touch me your vessel. Touch me physically, emotionally, spiritually. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight, dear God, that you will touch the hearer. Let faith rise up in their heart to clasp hold of the promises of God that are in these truths that we read tonight. Father, I ask that you fill every believer with the Holy Ghost and fire tonight. For all who have not experienced Pentecost, let them experience the fullness of your blessing tonight. Father, let everyone who has experienced Pentecost receive a refilling, a refilling of your glory. Father, when we leave, may we say it had been good to the Holy Ghost and to us to have been in this house. 
We thank you and praise you. Let everything be done decently and in order according to Scripture. In Christ's name, amen. While you're standing, reach for your Bibles and turn with me tonight to the Gospel according to St. John. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, just one verse, verse 7. In the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient or necessary that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Hallelujah. May God add his blessing upon this message tonight. You may be seated. I shared with you earlier this week that God is calling us out of our cage and into our purpose. The only way that can happen is when we live lives of holiness, as I spoke of Sunday evening. Last evening I told you that what God is looking for is a church that is alive. Now the only way that can happen is when the wind of the Spirit blows upon us. You see, in this text, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, giving them a farewell speech for just a little while. He's telling them, I've got to leave you. I'm going to go away. I must go to Jerusalem and suffer. I'll be rejected. Now, in these words, they found fear. In these words, no doubt, these disciples were worried because they were probably thinking to themselves, what are we going to do without him? If he leaves us, then who will continue preaching? You see, for three and a half years, they had been with him while he did the preaching. Who's going to teach the kingdom of heaven is at hand? If he's gone, who will preach the gospel? And no doubt they were worried because not only had he been the one preaching the gospel, but Who's going to heal the sick? If he's gone, who will there be to lay their hands upon the sick and infirm and cause them to be well? And no doubt they were worried because if he was the one that did the preaching and if he was the one that did the healing, he was also the one who performed the miracle of casting out devils. They had been confronted with devils before and surely they were wondering who in the world is going to do that. But while they were fearful, while they were worried, this was not a message of fear. It was not a message of worry, but rather it was a message of hope for them because while they were wondering who's going to preach the gospel and while they were wondering who's going to heal the sick and while they were wondering who was going to cast out the devils, Jesus had no worry whatsoever because he knew that he was looking at the ones that were going to preach. He was looking at the ones who were going to heal the sick. He was looking at the the ones who were going to cast out the devils. Did you know that Jesus let them know, hey, I've got to go away, but I will not leave you by yourself. You see, Jesus knew that on our own, we can mess some stuff up. Uh, come on, church of God. Uh, there's nobody that can mess stuff up better than people can. We can mess things up when nobody else thinks we can. But Jesus said, I'm not going to allow you to, to live off your own devices and live off of your own means and live off of your own capability because if you do it within yourself, then surely you're going to mess up. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. In fact, he tells us in John, he said, I'm going to go to my Father and when I get there, I'm going to pray the Father. I want to stop right there. You know, it's good to know that the pastor is praying for you. It's good to know that you have brothers and sisters praying for you but better still, we have the Son of the living God seated at the right hand of the Father and he's making intercession for you and I tonight. That means if you are a sinner here, Jesus is praying for you right now that you'll get saved. If you need to be sanctified, Jesus is praying for you right now. If you need the baptism in the Holy Ghost, Jesus is praying for you right now. If you need healing, if you need deliverance, oh my friend, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is praying on your behalf tonight. And when he prays, things happen. Oh, yeah. 
He said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, for it neither seeth him nor know him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. What Jesus was saying is there is another work of grace whereby the Spirit of God not only dwells with you, but he saturates you. He immerses you in his glory. He immerses you in his power. First of all, let me state this. Never tell a blood-bought, born-again child of God that they do not have the Spirit because the Bible said that they cannot even say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. It was he that introduced them to Jesus. Jesus said that when he, the Spirit, comes, he will not speak of himself but of those things which he has seen and heard. He said he's, he's going to introduce them to me. Did you know the Bible said that you must be born of the Spirit? Now, it is the Spirit that woos you. It is the Spirit that brings you to salvation. But Jesus said there's another experience because right now at salvation, he dwells with you. But there's going to come a moment in time where he baptizes you in the presence of the sweet Holy Ghost. I want to tell you, friend, there is a river that is flowing tonight and it's flowing out of our belly. Is, it is a living water whereby he wants to immerse his church. He wants to immerse his people. I would to God that every believer in this house get baptized in the Holy Ghost tonight. Oh, God, help me here. I need somebody to help me preach in this house. You see, he said, I'm going to pray to the Father. There is another experience. He's dwelling with you, but he shall be in you. Now, notice what he said, that this comforter that he was going to send, it was not just some other preacher. It was not just some other form of prophet or king. He said, I'm going to send another comforter. That word another is a lawn in the original. It means one of the same substance. He said, I'm going to send somebody that is just like me to stand by your side. Oh, can I tell you here, my friend, this comforter that he was talking about, he is just as equal to the Father as the Son is. He is just as equal to the Son as the Father is. They are three in one. We believe in the one whole God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you, friend, this comforter that he sent, he was just like the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. But take notice of this. In Jesus' humanity, because not only was he fully God, he was fully man, in his humanity, he could only be at one place at one time. But he knew that he had to send the Spirit of God because when he comes, he not only dwells with us individually, but he dwells with us corporately. You see, Jesus said, I've got to send a comforter that's just like me, so not only can one of you preach the gospel and not only can one of you heal the sick, and not only can one of you cast out devils, but I believe that Jesus was looking through the quarters of time and he said, I'm going to find a dozen or more people out of the alley, good church of God, that I'm going to lay my anointing upon that you can go out and do the works of the Father. In fact, Jesus Christ said, hey, if you believe in me, then greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. I want to tell you, friend, I believe that there is power in the anointing of the Holy Ghost to continue the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it is another comforter, one that will abide with you forever. This comforter, he was just like Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus neither had a beginning nor did he have an end. The Bible tells us in John 1 and 1 that in the beginning, now it was not talking about our form of beginning. He was saying from the very outset of everything, there was no beginning, but the word was with God. And the word was God. Always has been, always will be forever. Well, that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 9 and 14 about the Spirit of God. He said he is the eternal Spirit. I want to tell you, friend, the Holy Ghost did not just show up on the day of Pentecost. He has always been. It was the Holy Ghost that was a part of the triune meeting in glory when God said, let us make man in our image. It was the Spirit of God who breathed into the life of Adam and caused him to become a living being. It, it was he, the Spirit of God, that brooded over the earth. It was he, the Spirit of God, that time and time again throughout the Old Testament, we see where he moved upon men and women. The Bible said that the Spirit came upon El 
called dad and me dad the spirit came upon Samson and the spirit moved upon Jephthah and the spirit moved upon Gideon and the spirit moved upon David and the spirit moved upon Deborah time and time again we can see where the spirit was in operation and I want to throw this out to you as well my friend the spirit is still moving around here he has not gone away just because Jesus Christ left that he has not gone away just because the last apostle has gone to glory he is an eternal God that means he had no beginning he'll have no end he's always been will forever be because he is the eternal spirit but not only was he eternal like the Lord Jesus Christ the Bible tells us that he is omniscient like the Lord Jesus Christ. Does anybody remember times where Jesus would just speak out and say, well, I saw you when you were sitting underneath the tree. And Jesus would perceive what they were saying. He knew everything. Well, that's exactly who this spirit is because the Bible tells us in John 14 and 26 that when he, the spirit, has come, he shall teach you all things. Now, I've met some people in my life that thought they knew everything. <laughs> my brother said, uh-huh. <laughs> I've met some people even in the church that thought they knew everything. But I've only found one person that did, and that was God. You see, the Spirit being God, He knows everything. He knows the sin that doth so easily beset you. He knows what you're thinking right now. In fact, even as the Word is going forth, He knows the very thoughts and the intents of our heart. He sees what you do at all times, and He knows the things that are going on in your life everywhere. You see, you can even hide some things from your pastor. You can hide some things from the evangelist. You can hide some things from your family, but you can never hide anything from the all seeing eye of an almighty God that knows everything. And do you know, I believe that the reason that Jesus said, I need that kind of comforter to come is because he knew that there would come a time when they also needed to be taught the deep things of God. Did you know what a teacher does is nothing more but give you knowledge and understanding? Oh, my friend, the very first gift of the Spirit is wisdom. The second is the gift of knowledge. Did you know that the Bible said that when he comes, he will teach you all things. That means the very deep things of God. That means the secret things of God. That means even when you do not understand the scripture and when it seems foreign to you, the comforter, the one who wrote this book, the author of the scripture, he will begin to teach you all things. And did you know that even in the midst of things that happen in the church when, when we're trying to figure out what in the world is going on and you know we had this little issue that he said, she said, they said, we said and we're all trying to figure out what in the world is going on. It is the Spirit of God who reveals the truth unto his people. It is the Spirit of God that shows the righteous ways of the Lord. It is the Spirit of God that will lead you and guide you and direct you into all truth. And not only is he an eternal God, not only is he an omniscient God, the Bible tells us that he is also an omnipresent God. You know, Jesus said, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He said, lo, I'll be with you all the way even unto the end. Well, guess what? When Jesus left this earth in his humanity, he could only be with his disciples at one place at one time. But yet this spirit that he's talking about, this comforter, in Psalm 139 and 7, he said, Whether shall I go from your spirit? He said, If I escape into heaven, he is there. If I make my bed in hell, he is there. If I take the wing of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, there his hand will lead you, and his right hand will take hold of you. Church of God, I want to tell you, you cannot go anywhere where the spirit of God is not already there. Oh, I'm so thankful to know that not only is he with me when I go to church, but when I go to the doctor and they tell me that bad news the Holy Ghost is standing right by my side and when I'm driving on my way to work in the afternoon or in the evening or in the morning the Holy Ghost is sitting right by me on my way there and when I'm in the lawyer's office and they tell me that the divorce is finished and it's finalized your marriage is over the Holy Ghost is still standing right by your side and when you're sitting in the banker's office and he tells you that you're broke busted and disgusted and you're losing everything you've got the Holy Ghost is still standing by your side and when you're sitting by a loved one who's dying and on their way to glory. He's there to comfort you. He's by your side. And when you're looking six foot deep in that ground and you lift your hands and say, well, the Lord gave and the Lord took away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. The Holy Ghost is standing right by your side. I want to tell you, we just sang it and I believe it. He is with me everywhere and he knows my every care. You cannot go where he is not already there. Uh, lift up your hand and thank him for that abiding presence. 
But not only is he eternal, not only is he omniscient, not only is he omnipresent, my Bible tells me that he is omnipotent. He is equal, co-equal to the Father, co-equal to the Son. In 1 John 5 and 7, we are told that there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. I want to tell you, my friend, this comforter, he is just as much God as the Father. He is just as much God as the Son. He is the third person of the triune Godhead. He is God, the Holy Ghost. So therefore, I tell you, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise him. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He deserves to be worshipped just like the Father. He deserves to be praised just like the Son. He deserves to be magnified because He too is God. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is eternal. That's the kind of comforter that Jesus said, I'm going to send to you. I'm going to send one that's just like me so He can be with you always and forever. He can teach you all things and He'll always be by your side and you can know that God is always with you. I dare somebody just to lift up your hands and praise him because he is God tonight. Well, notice with me, please. He said, it is necessary that I go away. That word expedient literally means necessary. It is necessary that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I'll send them to you. Question, does anybody believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Does anybody believe that he is at the right hand of the Father? Then that means the Holy Ghost is here. Oh, yeah. He said that's necessary for you. You know, for some reason, we have made it an option or a suggestion in the church to receive the fullness of the blessed promise of the Spirit of God. We have come to a place where we say, well, if you think it's necessary, then you receive. And, and if you think that maybe you would like to have the baptism in the Spirit, then go ask for it. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, it is necessary for you that I go away because I've got to send the Holy Ghost to you. He breathed on his disciples. That word breathe in the original means that he forcefully commanded them to receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't give them an option. He didn't give them a suggestion. He said, I'm commanding you to receive the Holy Ghost. Why did he do that? Because while they were worried about who was going to preach and heal and cast out devils, Jesus said, I've got to have some people in the last days that's going to do it. He said, in the last day, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, that was those who are hungry and thirsty because the Bible said, only the hungry and only the thirsty shall be filled. He said, I'm going to use you to do that. Does anybody remember when Jesus sent his disciples out two by two? Do you ever hear of a great evangelistic crusade that took place while they were gone? You can talk back to me. Anybody remember where they said, oh, Jesus, we had thousands of people saved and converted. It didn't happen. No. In fact, you cannot find anywhere in Scripture where the disciples were able to effectively witness to a community before Pentecost, but after Pentecost, something changed. You, you see, this man that we know as the Apostle Peter, before Pentecost, after Jesus had told his disciples, somebody here tonight will betray me. This man, the leader of the pack, the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will, the associate pastor, he said, oh, Lord, I will not betray you. And Jesus said, well, you're not going to betray me, but you will deny me before the cock crows tonight. Oh, no, Lord, I'll be willing to go to the grave with you before I ever deny you. You know, that's how some of us are tonight. We'll sit around and we'll say, oh, I'm willing to die for the Lord. I'll give my life for him. Yeah. Let somebody put a gun to your head and see whether or not you're willing to testify for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in our humanity, we wouldn't do that. But see, this man, he stood and he, he was confronted by people. In fact, after they took Jesus to the, 
to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. They're standing on the porch there, and, and this man comes up and looks at Peter, and he says, Now, I've seen you with him before. I know that you're one of his disciples. And Peter probably thinking, Well, if they've just beat him, if they've just judged him, then surely they're going to do the same thing to me. He immediately denied him and said, No, I have no idea who in the world this man is. I think you have me mistaken for somebody else. Another gentleman comes up and says, Hey, I've listened to you speak. He said, Your speech gives you away. Your vernacular is that of the Galileans. You have walked with him. And yet again, that man looked at him and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never been around that man named Jesus. I've never known him. And, and you've got me confused with somebody else. The Bible said that even a little girl came up to him and said, I know that you've been with him. And he even shot away at a little teenage girl and said, I've never known him before. But after Pentecost came, the Bible said that the glory of the Lord filled that upper room and 120 were baptized in the Spirit of God. And that 120, they ran out the door of, the of that upper room and they stepped down into the street and they began to declare the wonderful works of God. But it wasn't just all of them that did that. Notice what took place. The Bible said that Peter stood up with the 11 and lifted up his voice and said unto them, All ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. And immediately that man who shied away when somebody said, I've seen you with him, that man who shied away when somebody said, I've heard your speech, and that man who shied away when the little girl came to him, he suddenly stood flat-footed and he squared his shoulders back. He lifted his head up high and he said, All of you that are listening, to me, I want you to know that it was your sin that placed him upon that cross. It was your unrighteousness whereby he bore the stripes upon his back, the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet and the crown of thorns upon his head. I want you to know that it was your sin that did it. And by the way, when you hung him on that cross, you said he was nothing more than a rebel. And when you hung him on that cross, you said he was nothing more than a blasphemer. And when you said that he was nothing more than a he and I want you to know that at that very moment, the Father up in heaven, he deemed him to be the Lord and the Christ. I want to tell you, friend, when the Holy Ghost resides in a believer of Almighty God, it doesn't matter if the crowd is five or 5,000. You can boldly declare the word of the Lord. It doesn't matter if you're just as timid as a sheep. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you become as bold as a lion. When the Holy Ghost resides in a believer of Almighty God, you can testify the Spirit of the Lord. He is upon me and he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. When the Holy Ghost comes upon a believer, you can tell every devil in hell, you can tell every politician, you can tell every movie star, behold, the kingdom of heaven, it is at hand. You see, there's something that takes place. Even Paul said, he said, I speak not unto you with the enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He said that my preaching is not in word only, but in power. You see, this is not just for the preacher. This is for the believer. When I talk about preaching, I'm not just talking about those who are called to pulpit ministry. I'm talking to the laity that's sitting out here tonight. You see, you say, well, preacher, I wouldn't even know how to witness if I had to. Don't worry about it. He said that when he comes upon you at that very hour, you will know exactly what to say. He said when you don't even know what to say, everything that you've read in this word, he said he'll bring back to your remembrance those things which you have studied. I want to tell you, church of God, we need the Holy Ghost anointing. We need the power of the Spirit of God so we can be more than pew warmers in the last day. But somebody that's running out in the street declaring that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of the Father. But who, who was not only going to preach? They were worried who's going to heal the sick. Well, Jesus didn't worry about that. You see, nowhere before Pentecost do you see where those disciples healed anybody. Nowhere. There's not a scripture to be found that says that the disciples healed people of palsy, leprosy, and so on. Jesus Christ did. But after Pentecost, if you flip from two to three, the Bible said that Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And there was a man there who was begging for alms. 
And when he asked them for some change to buy his lunch that day, they fastened their eyes upon him. You see, before the Spirit of God came upon them, they were probably timid to even talk to him. But when the Holy Ghost came upon them, that boldness that I just spoke about, it came upon them. They fastened their eyes upon them, and they looked at him and said, Hey, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible said that they reached down and took him by the hand. And when they lifted him up, he went leaping and running throughout the temple. And on that day, over five thousand people came to Jesus Christ and when you move over to Acts chapter 6 there's a man by the name of Stephen there. Stephen too had received the fullness of the promise of the Holy Ghost and he was in Jerusalem and not only did he preach Jesus Christ with boldness but the Bible said that many miracles were wrought by his hand and when you go to Acts chapter 8 a man by the name of Philip he was an evangelist he went down to Samaria and not only did he preach Jesus Christ but the Bible said that great joy came upon the city for many were healed of their sicknesses and their infirmities. Oh, can I tell you that time and time again when the disciples who were full of the Holy Ghost saw a need, they did not just walk by it, but through the authority of the Holy Ghost, men and women's lives, they were forever changed. When you go to Acts chapter 9, the Bible tells us that Brother Peter, he is in a little city called Lystra, and while he's there, there is a man by the name of Aeneas. Now, Aeneas was a paralytic. The Bible said that he was lying flat on his bed, but Brother Peter walked up to him him and said, Ennius, the Lord Jesus makes you whole. And instantly that man jumped up off of his bed. He took up that bed and threw it over his back and took off running and leaping throughout the street. In that very same chapter, there was a young girl by the name of Dorcas, also known as Tabitha. She had the breath of life leave her. She was dead as a doornail. But Brother Peter walked up to her bedside and he did not have a lot of fanfare or a lot of charm. All he did was by the boldness of the power of the Spirit of God, he spoke to her and said, Tabitha, it's time for you to get up. And immediately she got up healed by the power of God. I want to tell you, church of God, there is power in the anointing of the Spirit of God. The reason we need this Holy Ghost anointing is my Bible said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. May we never forget he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. I feel the healing virtue flowing right now. I dare you to lift up your hand and be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Knox, I don't know if you've ever said anything in the pulpit that you thought was crazy afterward. <laughs> I was preaching in Hampton, Virginia last year. The week that our governor and their governor simultaneously shut down everything. In fact, my revival ended on Wednesday evening. And everything was to shut down on Friday afterward. On Sunday morning, early that morning, I was awake. I had probably gone to bed somewhere around 2 or 3 a.m. that morning. And I was up before daylight crying out to God, Lord, these people are hurting Something's going on in this world that we don't know what's taking place. And I, I, I preached that morning. Never preached on it before. Haven't preached on it since. I don't believe. But he had not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I needed to bring some peace and some hope to that house. And when I got to that part about power, Brother Bateman, the Holy Ghost just began to move. People were up on their feet worshiping and magnifying the Lord. And by that time, everybody had started hoarding toilet paper. <laughs> And I don't know what hit me, but I just ran behind the pulpit. I said, I think the Holy Ghost just let me know that we need to let everybody else buy up all the toilet paper. And what we need to do is go down the baking aisle and buy up all the oil. Because my Bible said, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith shall raise them up. I want to tell you, Pentecostal church, we are missing a great aspect of the anointing of the Spirit of God. I still believe that there is power to heal those who are sick. I still believe that there is power to heal those that are infirm. I believe that the divine healing was provided for all in the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. My God, if his blood is strong enough to save 
save me from my sin, then surely his blood is strong enough to heal me of all of my sicknesses and infirmity. I believe with all of my heart that in this last day, what we're going to see is a moving of God whereby people are healed and delivered. If you want to see the Alley Good Church of God packed from front to back, I'll tell you how it'll happen. You let somebody who is blind have their eyes opened up. You won't be able to sit down on Sunday morning because somebody will be in your seat. You let somebody rise up out of their wheelchair who never had walked. You will not be able to find a seat even up in the choir, neighbor. I want to tell you one of the signs that's going to bring the people in is not only by our message, but when they see that the Lord Jesus Christ is still the heat. When they see that the Lord Jesus Christ is still the healer, that's when the pews are going to be packed out. My God, have mercy. My Lord, I want that power. Lift up your hand. I want that power in the church. I want that power in the church. But not only were they worried who was going to preach and heal the sick, they were worried who was going to cast out the devils. Anybody remember a time before Pentecost where the disciples ever cast out a devil? No. You can't find it. In fact, a father came to Jesus and said, Master, my son is possessed of a devil. And I brought him to your preachers. You licensed them. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. You licensed them. But they couldn't do anything. You know what Jesus said? Oh, ye of little faith. Now, in our modern day English, he literally said, How long do I have to put up with you? In the King James, it says, How long must I suffer thee? He was saying, How long do I have to put up with you? He said, Do you not know that this kind goeth forth by prayer? And some, some writings say, and fasting. You see, we've got to understand something. First of all, notice his words there, this kind. Does anybody ever study things like that? Well, why did he say this kind? Did you know that the Gospel of Mark is the most demonic book in all of the Gospels? On three separate occasions, Jesus cast out devils in that book. But in this particular setting, he said, now this kind doesn't just go out by your little fast songs. And, and this kind doesn't go out just because you sprinkle some oil on them. There's got to be something more inside to fight this kind of devil. You know, I believe with all of my heart that the scripture proves to us that there are different levels of devils. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, that one down here, you might be able to sing, he abides at 110 miles an hour, they might run. This one up here, no, he's not going to do it. So you're not just going to be able to cast out any old devil any old time you want to just because you claim to be a Christian. Can I mess with your theology? Has anybody ever heard, well, if you can ever just get that person to start saying Jesus, you know they've been delivered. Have you, have you ever heard that? That's a lie. Go back and study the Gospels. Uh, the demons inside of the individuals that Jesus delivered, every one of them said, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. Jesus, thou Son of David. <laughs> what are you here to do to me. Well, why have you come to torment me, Jesus? They know who he is. The devil inside of the man in the house of the seven sons of Siva. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Church of God, let me give you some wise advice. Never stir up more devils than you have power to cast out. Because just like those seven sons, the devil inside of that man beat those boys naked and ran them out of town. That's what the Bible said. But whenever you go to Acts chapter 16, after the day of Pentecost to come, the Bible said that Brother Paul and Silas, they were trying to plant a church, and there was a, there was a, a girl there, a little damsel with a spirit of divination. And the Bible said that this girl, through that devil, 
began to speak out and say, oh, these are the sons of the Most High God. These are men of the Lord. And, and she began to mock them. The Bible said that for a little while, they had to deal with that stuff. But finally, they got sick and tired of being mocked at. They got sick and tired of the devil inside of her making fun of them. And they stopped one day. And Brother Paul looked at her and said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I adjure you to come out. And the Bible said that instantly at that very hour, that demon came out of that young girl. The Bible tells us again in Acts chapter 8 when Philip went to Samaria. Not only did people get healed, but they said many were delivered of evil spirits. I want to tell you, friend, we have power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost over the devil. I want to tell you, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, when the Comforter abides with you, you can look every devil in the eye and let them know the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. When the Comforter abides with you, there is no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn it. When the Comforter abides in you, you can tell them greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and if God be for me then what devil in hell can be against me I want to tell the church of God it's time we step into the enemy's camp and take back what is stolen from us I want to tell you there is still power in the anointing of the Holy Ghost to my Lord have mercy he said submit yourself therefore unto God resist the devil and he will flee from you well Come play something for me quickly, musicians. He said, it is necessary that I go away. Notice what he said. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is necessary that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him unto you. Anybody catching that? You know what Jesus is saying? He was saying, I'm not just going to give it to the preacher. I'm not just going to give the power to the teacher, the singer. But when I send the comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, I'm going to send him to every person that's hungry. I'm going to send him to every person that's thirsty. For this promise, it is unto you and to your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You know what he's saying? Behold, I send the promise of my Father. Tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Can I tell you tonight, with all of my heart, I believe that what God is wanting to do in this last hour is pour his spirit out afresh and anew upon his church. As they begin to play, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little secret. And I, I've struggled with some of this. And I've told several of my friends, I normally do not talk about my education but I'm completing a doctoral program I've been in school now for 10 years for the bachelor's the master of divinity and I have less than a year now on my doctor you know what my study my, my entire dissertation is based upon personal evangelism as seen through the eyes of the spirit in fact the title of it thus far is spirit led evangelism Evangelism as seen in the book of Acts. It is actually called a evangelistic paradigm for the 21st century Pentecostal church. You know what I have discovered through sources, statistics from major, all the major Pentecostal denominations in America are claiming the same thing. Too few people who were spirit-filled. Did you know that according to our own reporting in the church of God, 
from 1960 until 2006. I'm currently gathering all the information now from 2007 up until current time. They literally went through and took all the numbers when we started recording through computer in 1960 from those who ministers claimed that were saved compared to those who were baptized in the Spirit. Only 6.1% of the membership of our denomination is spirit-filled. You know what the Assembly of God USA said? Now they brag about being the largest Pentecostal movement in North America with three million members. But you know what they said? I have their records. Three percent are spirit-filled. Out of three million, eighty-five thousand are spirit-filled. Do you know what the International Pentecostal Holiness Church said? Their own mouth. We estimate 1 to 2% being spirit-filled. Do you realize where we are in time? Do you realize the crucial hour in which we are living? Why? Why would we want to live now and operate the church now without him? Friend, you can have the finest preacher in all America. He might be an incredible orator. But without the Spirit of God, he's nothing. You may have the finest musicians, the finest singers, but without the anointing, your talent is useless. You may have the greatest teachers, the greatest board members, Without the Spirit of God, they might as well just sit down. The flesh, it profits nothing. The Spirit gives life. It's not by might, nor by power. It is by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Friend, if we're ever going to be a church alive, like I preached on last night, this is how it happens. When every one of us get to the place that we are so hungry for his power, for his indwelling, his abiding presence, that we want him more than the very breath that we breathe, that's when we'll see a change in the church of America. It won't be by whoever sits in the White House or the Senate or the Congress. Friend, I want to tell you, I don't care who it is. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. It's only by the power of the Holy Ghost in the church. You, you may think I'm crazy here. But you must understand the only thing that's keeping this world from crumbling is us. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? The only thing that's holding this world together is the church. Read your Bible. When we're gone, hell on earth breaks loose. So while we're still here, oh, holy God, while we're still here, let's work. While we're still here, let's operate in the anointing of the Spirit of God. Preacher, preach under the anointing. Singers, sing under the anointing. Musicians, play under the anointing. Teachers, teach under the anointing. Leaders, lead under the anointing. Members, live under the anointing. And let's see the church turn the world upside down like those early disciples did. Stand with me right now and lift up your hands and begin to praise the Lord. That's all I want you to do for just a moment. Just worship. Just worship. Just worship.
I want everybody to look at me quickly. Now, I know that there are some here. I, I'm not questioning. I know that there are some here tonight who have never received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Some of you may be asking, preacher, how do I know if I have received? If you do not know how you know, then you've not received. Because when he comes, you know it. Nobody has to shake your chin and tell you what to say. Nobody has to tell you, oh, you receive. You'll know when you receive the Holy Ghost. And I want you to know, if you have never received, you're not a second-class Christian. You're just as much a child of God as I am. You're on your way to heaven. But there is a gift that he's wanting to give you. Anybody like presents? I promise you, if you bring me a present, I'm going to take it. It's a gift. He's giving a gift. Why would you not want to take it? And open it up and begin to use it. If you are here tonight and you have never received the baptism, but you have faith right now that this promise is for you and that you're ready to receive, would you just step out right where you are and make your way to this altar with your hands lifted up? Come on, quickly. I know you're here. You're here. Nobody should have to beg you. I'm not going to. I'm going to give you this chance. If you're ready to receive, then step out right now. The promise is for you. He gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. Now, here's what I want. If you are ready to receive a refilling, which should be everybody in this house, if you want a refilling of the Spirit, God, I need that anointing for these last days. Get out from where you are. Make your way to this altar. Begin to worship him and say, Lord, fill me. Fill me. Come on, church, let the Holy Ghost fall on you tonight. Let the Holy Ghost refill you tonight.
Yes, let him touch you. He's touching some of you right now. He's touching some of you right now. I just want you to begin to worship him right now. The old timers used to say he comes on the wings of praise. I just want you to praise him. He'll inhabit the praises. He'll abide in the praises of God's people. He'll abide. Come on, lift up your voice, church of God. Don't be ashamed. Lift up your voice and worship him. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. I will sing about him, I'll shout about him, I'll talk about him to everyone I meet. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Turn to the upper room in Jerusalem. He said that when he got to heaven, he would pray to the Holy Father to let the Holy Ghost from heaven Hallelujah. fall on me. Let him fall on you, church. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Well, I will sing. I'll sing about him. I'll shout about him. Talk about him everyone I need. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Let it fall on me. I'll sing about him, shout about him, talk about him to everyone I need. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Jesus told them and went to the upper chamber. They rejoiced while they praised his name with one accord. And as they praised him for the promise, there was fire when the sound from heaven. And then the Spirit came as promised by the Lord. Let the Holy Ghost. Pull that third verse up. Listen, they're getting ready to sing the last verse. And when they do, I want you to begin to pray for one another. If you feel comfortable in doing this, I want you to lay hands on somebody. And I want you to pray over them that the Spirit of God would fall on them. You know, I believe that that happens. I believe that God honors us when we abide by his word and lay hands on one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that he's ready to do something in this church? you believe he's ready to do something in you? Sing it right now. Find somebody. Pray for somebody. Not a big group of people. One or two people. Lay your hands on them. Come on. God's word tells you how to have it. You must pray and believe his promises for you. And if you yield your life to Jesus and you pray for the blessed promise, and he'll fill you with the Holy Spirit through and through. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. I'll sing about him, shout about him, talk about him, everyone I need. Let the Holy Ghost. 
He's moving. He's moving. He's moving. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing it one more time. 